Welcome to New Generation, Pastor Mike. And Lady Monique. We thank you for subscribing to our channel. We pray that you be blessed by everything that you see because if we can change your mind, we can change your life. Control who we are. 
People of God, I get it. You are in your flesh. I get it. We got to fight this flesh, and that's one of my questions here at the bottom. Is there anything good in the flesh? The Bible says no good thing dwells in the flesh. No so if we know that there's nothing good that dwells in the flesh, why do we still try to fight the battle in the flesh? Why do we still try to fight this war the way that God has told us not to? Yet still, we whine, cry, we complain because nothing's going right because we won't switch over and fight the battle the way God told us to. We're still trying to do it with our 38s, 45s, 9 millimeters. We're still trying to do it with this 9 millimeter in our mouth. We're still trying to uh, talk folk down, cuss folk, uh, give them a scripture, uh, bless them out. Many different ways we come up with how we get this tongue in so much trouble. And once we get into the trouble, now we're trying to backtrack and we're trying to figure out how to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So now we're doing damage control. Mm -hmm. And typically when we're doing damage control, most people make it worse than it was in the beginning. Instead of just honestly owning it and apologizing. Mm -hmm. Owning it and apologizing. Owning it and apologizing. Yeah. God, I've done wrong. I ain't trying to be deceptive because that's where we're going. Deception versus integrity. Instead of being so deceptive in life, and it's some folk, that's all they know how to do. They don't know how to just come and tell you they've messed up, they've done wrong, or anything of that nature. It's always a, I've got to figure out how to get around this and how to get out of this. i got to figure out a way, instead of telling the pastor that um, I didn't come to church Wednesday night, maybe, or Sunday, because I just didn't feel like it. It's deception. We come up with a reason why, and this is where we're headed to. Deception means misrepresentation of the truth. I'm not even going to ask a show of hands, because I don't want nobody to lie here to think that they <laughs> mightier than thou himself. But I know that in my past, I have misrepresented the truth. I'll speak about the pastor tonight instead of the people, because somebody might get upset. <laughs> misrepresenting the truth. You don't think that it's an all-out lie, but you just feel like, hey, I didn't, you know, I didn't lie. I just didn't tell you exactly what was going on. <laughs> and then this is how we justify it. It wasn't none of your business, no way. That's what we do. <laughs> we have this battle going on in the side, inside of us, and that's where we're going. I should have wrote that down, but we're actually going to um, James 1, 14, 15. I'll put it down here. James 14, 15. We're going to talk about that fellow that constantly just keeps us in some type of trouble. And that fellow's name is you. Why owe you? Some things we can blame on the devil, and some things we need to blame directly right on up to us. The devil didn't make you stay home, you were just lazy. Because <laughs> it's amazing how we get tired and lazy. And, and, and I truly believe that it's real. When it's time to come to church or it's time to sit at the house, and read your Bible, I, people don't understand. It is a spirit that tries to come over you and take over you. And yes, sometimes it is truly just you. But it's amazing how, and I want somebody to try to get this tonight. Isn't it amazing how when we have to be at work five days a week, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, it don't matter how we wake up, we're going to press our way to that job. 
But we will use the excuse, well, if it be the will of God, I'll be in church. You don't wake up and say, if it be the will of God to your boss, I'll be at uh, work. All right. The will of God goes out the window when it comes to you going to work. But it's always something we use in church when we try to give some love. We want some leeway about making it to service or not. Or, you know, really supporting the church, really working for the church, really doing um, what the Bible tells us to do for God's house. We need to look at this house as this is God's house. It's not Pastor Mike's house. It's God's house. So that's why we do all that we do financially, physically. That's why we do all that we do spiritually, all that we do prayerfully. We do it all because it's God's house. It's been anointed. It's the anointing that makes the difference. Not your money, not your time, not your clothes, not what you drove up in. It's the anointing. So why are certain situations in our lives not going anywhere? you got to question some things. Stop living the same way and just saying, okay, well, that's just the way it is. It's the anointing, according to the word of God, that destroys a lot of stuff in our life. But some of us don't have that anointing because we caught up in too much other stuff. So we're going to start out with, um, I'm going to start out with James 1, 14, 15, but I want to come back to Matthew 23. Because this here, I want some folk tonight to see yourself for who you really are. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to speak out. You don't need to let nobody know that this is you. But the very thing that Jesus was calling out to the Pharisees it's all these different things. Hypocrites. He called them blind guys, attention seekers, greedy, self-indulgent, snakes. I want to make sure that that's none of us. And if it is us, it's important tonight to confess those sins. Confess those things that that's what's holding some of us back to not being able to get where God wants us to be because we're trying to fight this battle on the wrong territory. We're trying to fight this battle tonight with flesh and blood. And some of us can't figure it out. Why are we not getting anywhere? It seems like we're not gaining any ground. Because you're on the devil's territory and you're trying to fight his battle with the wrong weapons. So, let's read James 1, 14, 15 first. It says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So if you're going to write anything, you please put down that the desire is inside of you, not inside of the devil. The desire is inside of you. How you're going to be enticed, and enticed means to be dragged away. You're being dragged away by what's inside of you. That's a hard pill for some people to swallow because we want to blame everything on the devil we want to blame everything on everybody else. You're being caught up in situations because of what's inside of you. So how do we deal with what's inside of us tonight? How do we deal with it? Seriously, on a, on a, um, somebody give me an answer. How do you deal with what's inside of you? Now, in a, in a Remember now, I said that there's no good thing that the wheels on the inside. So how do we deal with that very thing that's dragging us away? So I want you all to think about this because it's people around us, friends, family, brothers, sisters, cousins, mothers, fathers, children, that are being dragged away constantly because of something on the inside. And a lot of us don't know how to deal with it. Confess your sins and pray. All right, what if it's uh, your sister? She's been dragged away by her. She's got some type of addiction, whatever it is. How, how can we help people like that? Well, one of the things is that um, the Lord has to spend time with that person. And um, it's, not so much letting, it's not so much letting them know that um, I know you want drugs or whatever the case may be. Because they already know. Um, and I would sit down and I would talk to her. My sister, I would sit down and talk and tell her the truth of how it's affecting the family of 
what's going on with her because she won't acknowledge it and let's get her the help that she needs. So how is that affecting the family? Because no, sometimes when we have family members on drugs, it's, it's still in the line. All right, let's say it's not drugs. Let's say it's, um, she's addicted to pornography. Concern. <coughs> concern about because it's so how do we help them? Well, yes, how does the church, how do you, you represent the kingdom of God, how do you help someone close to you deal with an addiction? See, a lot of times we'll go to drugs, but it's so many other addictions, glory, I'm telling you, if I were to put, I don't even have enough, there's so many addictions right here in this room. And it's not drugs. Some people, yeah. for example, are addicted to praise. If they do anything for you or the church, if you don't say thank you and you don't say it more than once, their day is done. They're upset. I mean, it's like they really have an art with you to the point where they want to come back at you at some point and say, I did such and such and you didn't do this. And then you do it and it's like they get a feel good. So are they wanting us to help? Because see, that's half of the Bible there is they want you to help them, or they want help. Let, they, let's say they don't. Let's say they don't want you to help. Not necessarily. You don't know if they do or don't. Let's say you don't. You don't know that part of it. Okay. Um, you can go out there. Oh, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I would say um, help them replace that, like um, possibly introduce them to something else that can become a habit, just like whatever it is that they have been addicted to has become a habit. To get right, introduce them to something else that, you know, that you know that they're interested in this. Um, say, I don't know, who you dance? They like dancing. So introduce them to um, dance in some way, shape, or form. Something but here's where the church is going wrong, in a sense. We mean well, but here's our biggest problem. You can give people solutions, and maybe you can bring them in here once a week for dance to try to get them out of that environment. There's six other days they're going back to that environment. So, yes, you gave them something temporarily to do. And I'm not saying it won't help. I'm playing the other side here tonight. What can we do? And you go say something. Prayer changes things. And some things come only through fasting and praying. And we need to do that without ceasing and rebuke that thing constantly. So do you think we get tired of praying for people? Honestly? Sometimes. Well, no. Do you think we pray enough? Because if you see that somebody has an addiction, we should be taking them before the Lord every opportunity that we can. But a lot of us do get tired. I'm just going to be real with you. Being real with you. We don't pray enough when we see that there's a problem with someone. We're easy to kind of give up on people after we went a little ways. Maybe we went... Five yards, 10 yards, 50 yards, whatever it is. 99, there's still a yard left. We, we're easy to just say, hey, you know what? Yo, yo. Um, I, I'm finding that, you know, I'm going to use my son. I'm praying for my son. And I was praying one day, and the Lord just spoke to me and told me, don't give up. So I'm not giving up on him. It's a constant prayer every day. I walk around the house all day long and I'm praying for him. Mm -hmm. And there's other things I'm praying for too, but sometimes I just have, I just pray for him all day, you know, just walk around. And I, I, it's not that I'm just constantly praying, Lord, do this shit. I'm thanking God for what he's going to do. Yeah. I began to say, Lord, I'm just thanking you, God. I'm giving you praise for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, Lord. You know, it's a constant thing when you've got somebody in prayer or you've got somebody in need of prayer. It, it, you just can't pray for that person a couple of times and leave it. You have to constantly 
present him to the Lord and tell God about it. God, I just thank you, God. I'm still continuing to pray and give you glory, pray what you're going to do for this guy, or what you're going to do with this woman, or what you're going to do with this man, or what you're going to do with my son or daughter. I'm just giving God, and that's what I'm doing. I'm continuing to pray because I knew in due time it's going to come a change. God's going to let me know. It's, he going to come a change. It's going to come a time. He's going to change. It may not be in my time, but in God's time, God has a, I know a time, let me put it, that he's going to bring my son around. And I'm, I'm not giving up on that. I continue to pray for that and lift him up before the Lord because, like I said, it's not in my time. It's in, in God's time. I feel it's in, in God's time. He's going to do it. So I'm not giving up on it. I continue to pray. So that's what we need to do. When you present something to the Lord, continue to pray. Give God and tell God about it, you know, until you see a change. Okay. Somebody over here raise their hand. I, I was going to say basically what she said. Um, just... Keep them before God and ask God to touch their heart and mind for that change, to prepare them for a change in their life. And just keep them lifted up before God. Because sometimes when you go constantly to a person and constantly bringing up that subject and everything, that will make them not want to hear anything you want to say. They get tired of you like badgering them almost. You know? right. So if you just tell it to them and back up and leave them in the hands of the Lord, I feel like, you know, like she said, in due time, God's going to bring them bring them, out, bring them through it. Okay. Yes. So, what do you have, what if you have intent on being like them and praying, but you don't know how to pray, but you have intent on helping that person out? Right. Now, what I'm going to do is compile pretty much what different ones said here. What I would tell you, if you don't know how, especially if you are in a Bible-based ministry, the first person you should be reaching out to is your pastor. And your pastor should be giving you a prayer, even if he has to write it down for you and say, hey, look here. See, the problem is, is we think that we just got to say stuff like we're just so eloquent that we just have to write everything. In the, and this is taking me right into our lesson in Matthew 23 when we go there, is this is the Pharisees we're doing things outwardly to impress folk. Your conversation outwardly does not impress God. It's what's on the inside of your heart. This is how simple it is, no lie. It's a matter of you pouring out your heart, having a conversation like you may have with uh, Sister Becky beside you. Just saying, you know what, I just don't understand this. It's a conversation of saying, God, I need you to help do X, Y, Z. That's how simple it is. And we make it hard because of tradition and, and folk in front of us. And we hear people say these nice prayers and we're like, man, <laughs> you think they really get to God quicker or any better than you just saying? And I'm going to show you that here. Um, I find it here in a little bit while we're going forth. The Pharisee and the uh, publican came before God. And, of course, one is saying, hey, look here, I pay my tithes, um, you know, I fast. I do all these things that were just like up here. But then, okay, the other guy says, you know what, God, forgive me for I'm a sinner. And the Bible says that he is exalted more than the one that was had his chest puffed out and saying all that he did. And he did the right things. Paying his tithe, uh, fasting, helping the, the needy. He was doing the right things, but once again, his heart wasn't right. And that's what we're going to get into. Matthew 23 really exposes the Pharisees and the scribes for who they really were. And Jesus didn't play with them then. I mean, he came hard at them. He tells them about just basically being just Greek. All these different things. These are the things that we're going to talk about. This is what he, just some of what he calls the Pharisees in this conversation. Attention seekers. Greedy. Hypocrites. Blind, self-indulgent, <laughs> snakes. And the sad part of it is, is we still have this in the church. Mm -hmm. We have folk uh, seeking attention for whatever they do. Mm -hmm. We have folk in the church that are blind to no matter how much the word of God goes forth in their minds. They don't see no wrong. They, don't, they think that they're the only ones, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's in the church. Yes. They think they're the only one. Ready to go to heaven. Everybody else around them is hell bound and on, they, on their way because they just don't get it. 
You have to be careful. The Bible, that's why the Bible says, judge not and ye shall not be judged. Yeah. Greed. Oh, glory be to God. But I don't want to, I'm just kind of throwing a, a few out there, but hopefully I've got your question answered. Is <coughs> It doesn't take a big, eloquent prayer to get to God. He just wants you to humble yourself before him and even tell him, God, I don't even know how to pray. And then he'll say, well, I got things in the Bible that'll help you. If you open up that Bible, it's times where you can just take a song and you can just say that song. You know what? When you're at home, because some of us, we feel like we sing better, of course, in the shower. We sing better when ain't nobody else around. That's because we don't have anybody critiquing us. <laughs> it's different when you grab this mic up here and everybody's listening to you. Yeah. But at home, that's your time to take a song and you can sing it and say it any way you want. And you're talking to God. Amen. You're worshiping with God. Mm -hmm. It ain't about other people around you. I told you all before that I was going through something and and, and, and I, I got in the shower, and I mean, I, I got in the shower, and I'm, thank God I didn't fall out in there and hit my head, nothing, but I mean, I was in there going to war in the shower. I got in there to take a shower, but the Spirit of God hit me, and I'm telling you what, I began to sing, I began to pray, I began, I mean, I was going for it. It's your secret closet, it's your personal space mm -hmm. that you know what, no matter how you say it, God is listening. Yes. Exactly. And he honors your request. Yes, he honors your oh, prayer. Oh, yes. He's looking at your heart. He ain't looking at all this. We put these suits on and ties on and we put these pointed toe shoes on and dresses down to our ankles. <laughs> and, I don't care enough about all that stuff. That's why I constantly say in this church here, I don't care how they come through that door. <laughs> they come through the door, you come to hear the word of God. I hey look at here, we're gonna deal with that. The word of God. The word of God will clean folk up. That's right, that's right. Not you, but that's we tend right. to think our words will. Yeah. So let's go on and jump into Matthew 23. It's power. Power. And we're gonna read the whole chapter so you can just hear some of this stuff that Jesus is like laying down to the people like <coughs> 39 verses. 23rd chapter of Matthew. And, and while we're going through it, mark down the different things that you see what he's actually telling the disciples. I mean, telling the Pharisees and the scribes who they are because this is who we don't want to be. The Bible was given, us, given to us to give us an example of the things that we should and should not be doing. The Bible is truly God in the book. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, <laughs> for they say and they do not do. For they blind, bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. That word phylactery is they used to have a, to be seen and let people know that they were who they were. It was a, 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 a garment here that actually they says was attached to their head. It, it was yeah. all to be seen. They loved the best places of, at feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by me and rabbi, rabbi. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. <coughs> Isn't it amazing how he who is greatest among you, just like Jesus, is supposed to serve? You know, I'm not here to, as your pastor, for example, to act like I'm some kind of king. I'm here to serve, to work. <laughs> And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. 
But woe to you, scribes. Let's get down on it. <laughs> and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against me, and for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites again, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Wow. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. <laughs> Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple it is nothing but whoever swears by the goal of a temple he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind for which is greater the goal or the temple that sanctifies the goal. And whoever swears by the altar it is nothing but whoever swears by the gift that on it he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithes of men and eyes and cumin, human, and have neglected the weighter matters of the law justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides who strain out a net and swallow a camel. That's one of the things here I put up here. Swallow, strain the net and swallowing the camel. What they were doing back then is, is the things that were small that really, they were minor they put more emphasis on that than the things that were great, which was the word of God. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. These are words that I'm talking about. Outside <coughs> you are all of good, but inside you are wrecked. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, and that the outside of them may be cleaned also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones, mm, okay. and all uncleanness. Yes. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and law. Mm -hmm. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's right, baby. Amen. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Listen, listen to all these way they are being described now. <laughs> Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them, persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous, bloodshed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Shortly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who killed the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. <laughs> See, your house is left to you desolate. <coughs> For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it is important after reading all that, and I did that because sometimes we just don't read. And I think it's important just to sit down sometimes and read the whole chapter. Don't just read the part that, like, for example, I'm trying to give you the part of straining the net 
and swallow the camel. Read before it and read afterwards. And you're going to get more of an understanding of what you're actually reading. That there, I'm sure some may have heard it and been like, I don't really understand it, but I'm going to keep on reading. Straining the net and swallow the camel. As I said before, your child uh, comes home and um, they were late getting home, maybe two minutes. You told them to be on the 7th, they came in at 7.02. You put them on punishment for a month. But then the child turns around and holler off and hit somebody right in the mouth for no reason at all, and you say nothing. It happens in the church. Certain things get looked over for whatever reason, and that's what you have to be careful about, and that's what Jesus was telling them is, is you are all looking at the small stuff and you're not focusing on what's most important. Be careful about your lives and the things around us. It's easy. So, and I'm going to tell you, we often say this, especially when you have two or more children, you'll end up, the first child really catches it. And the last child, it's like you just let them do whatever because you're tired. You just like the same stuff that you beat the other child for, you put them on punishment. This one here doing it, and you just be like, man, it will, whatever. <laughs> Oh, it happens. Anybody that have more than one child, trust me, you get tired. Folk are just tired. You just be like, you know what? But that's what was going on. It is so important that we truly focus on the Word of God and what God is telling us. The only way that we'll ever go to another level, and I'm going to use you. We're not going to use the church. We're going to use you because what I, I'm a firm believer, if you can focus in right and you can get to the next level, the church automatically goes to the next level because you fill up the church. But when we have a lot of people that they, they feel like that, you know, I'm good where I am, then basically that's the type of church you'll have. we just good where we are. Right. We should always be striving to be better, to do better, to want more of God. None of us sitting here today, I don't care who you are, I don't care what your title is, I don't care, care where you go, how long somebody been in the ministry, you've been saved for 40 years, 50 years. You can do more to better your relationship with God Amen. every day. Amen. Why did Paul say, I lay those weights and sins to the side that's so easy to set things. Every day, daily, I lay them to the side every day. Why? Because I need to go before the throne. I need to go before God, and I need to make sure I'm clean. So I need to make sure that everything is right. I need to make sure that, you know what, God, show me some a different revelation about your word. How is it that we're still reading the same Bible thousands of years later, and we're constantly getting revelation? Because what happens in your life God will use the word of God to give you understanding about your life. Your life won't be, it shouldn't be, where it is today. It shouldn't be the same place here and maybe next year or the next six months. Something, and that's what the two words that I'll give you tonight that I didn't write down is, is be careful that you don't get mixed up. Movement and progress, they are not the same thing. <clears throat> Movement is truly physical motion. I'm, do, I'm making movement right now. But that has nothing to do with am I progressing. Progress is development. It's advancement. Can you see? I, mean, and I, I challenge you tonight. Look where you were. Look where you were in 20... At the beginning of last year, 2021, look where you were at the beginning and look where you are now. You don't need to tell anybody. It's between you and God. If you, you know. Do you feel like that you have seen any advancement in your life? Or have you just been moving? If you're just covering space, but you're not going anywhere, and it has nothing to do with how much money you've made, Sometimes you can make a ton of money and you're still in the same place. You got a bank account with some money in it, but you're still in the same place. I'll be honest with you, for me personally, I went through those stages, and I'm in that stage now. For me, advancement is truly about what's inside of me. And everybody don't get there, I, I believe. 
I think some people search for that almighty stinking dollar till they die. And they will attach progress to that dollar. And their life could truly be in shambles and possibly on the verge of committing suicide and all kinds of other stuff or just depressed and everything else because of trying to <clears throat> retain, trying to get something that when you do get it, you still feel empty. There is still a void. Why is that? We get so mixed up in thinking money is the answer to what we really need to sustain life. Money is the answer to a lot of things the Bible, the Bible says that. It'll pay your life bill. It'll pay this church note. But if the church note is paid, but I have a bunch of sick people in the church. I mean, yeah, we got the church no pay, but it's a lot of sick people. So then if we got a lot of sick people, guess what we have a lot of? We have a lot of hypocrites in the church. We got a lot of blind folk in the church. We got a lot of attention seekers in the church. We got a lot of greed in the church. We got a lot of self-indulging in the church. We got some snakes in the church. We got a lot of stuff in the church. Folk are not healed. They are not healthy. But their minds is all about how can I get you? How can I get you? Oh, you know what? I'm going to befriend you and make you think that I'm your girl. I'm your guy. I'm going to do. And the whole time, I got another arterial motive. Is I'm trying to get what's in your bank account. Or I'm trying to get what's in your pants. I'm trying to get something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we have to watch out for okay. when we out here with folk. Uh -huh. And the Bible, listen to this. Why does the Bible <laughs> say, <laughs> try the spirit by the spirit, yeah. whether they are of God. Yeah. You just can't believe somebody because they come along and say, oh, yes, I'm holy, y'all. I have a Bible, Lord. You know, I truly believe in God. I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm all these good things. Because I'm a firm believer. Your character will tell me a lot about who you are. Just sit back and start watching, folks, instead of, you know, let them run their mouth, but just let them keep talking, keep talking. But really check them out. Put them in situations where they have a choice to do right or do wrong. That's right. That's right. Put them in a situation where they have a choice to cuss you out or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put them in that situation. Yes. Come on, Mama. You can judge folks by their character. Yes. That's true. That's true. And not so much judge them, but you can you can know who labors among them. Yes. Yes. That's my character. Yes. Because mm -hmm. that's really important. Mm -hmm. it, it's so important to understand who's around you at all times. Right. You never want to be an accessory to some junk. That's right. Mm -hmm. You had no idea you didn't want to do anything wrong but being around that person you just helped, got caught up in their junk. As I told you, if I take a bucket of water and just toss straight up, it's going to get more than one person. It's called collateral damage. Trust me, the ripple effect. It's going to catch more than one person, and you may not have had anything to do with it at all. You just happen to be around. And that's what we got to be careful about, is just hap happening to be around. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to this Matthew 23. Deception, misrepresentation of the truth, integrity. Do you have integrity tonight? Are you, can folk, if, if I gave your name to 10 of your friends, would they all say you're an honest person? Or would they say, ah. And if you notice, I ain't even say the word deception. Just say, ah. <laughs> When somebody say your name or something, they're like, I don't know. You know how people pretty much, they'll say, oh, uh, Pastor Mike, kids they do, but, and that but, just yeah. cancels out everything that you just said. <laughs> All you're doing is you're trying to set me up to dive straight in. Oh, he's a good dude, but. 
<laughs> that right there is a problem. You don't want people having. And granted, can you call people to always say the right things about you? No, you can't. Right. But if you know that you are an honest person, a person of integrity, that's what matters most to you. Other folk, some it's, it's some folk out here. They're gonna find something wrong with you, no matter what you say and do. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you try to be to them, because that's just. It's some, it's some, here we go, it's some sick people out here. It's some folk that truly, when, when I talk about what could you do to somebody that's in your life, because it's not just drugs. It's so many things that people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that they're addicted to. They're addicted to people, you know, constantly just trying to pick them up and constantly just trying. It's so much stuff that every one of you all says something that we could compile and put together. One of the things, like Lady Monique said, sit down. I believe she said something like this. Sit down and, and talk or give this person <laughs> something else to do. See if you can't interest them into something else. And I'm a firm believer because if you find, I find a lot of people out here, say, for example, that's trying to give up um, drugs. You'll find that they may go to smoking now because they like, look at here, I'd rather be smoking than trying to do the drugs. I've run into quite a few people like that. Well, what happens is, is now they start gaining weight, and they're smoking, and now they don't like the weight, so now they try to figure out how can I get back to the other side. So <laughs> you can give somebody else something else, but it is more to it that has to go along with it. Giving them something else, they're going back to that environment for the next six days. So you give them something on Saturday, on Monday, whatever to do. Well, when they go home, they got to still be in the same environment. It is so important. Folk really have to learn. We're going to deal with the physical part over here for a second before we go to the spiritual side. It is so important that you must change your environment. If they're not willing to change their environment, I would say nine out of ten times they're going back to whatever it is. That's right. If I know that pornography is a problem, if I show up to your house and you're watching a flick, I can't, I can't stay there. But if I sit down thinking, oh, man, I'm all right, man, I ain't, I ain't. Guess what? I'm, I just put my, myself right back into the lion's den, mm -hmm. and I don't have nobody to blame but myself. Amen. So we have to give them more than just a day. It may take you to really come out of yourself where you really check in on this person more than what you normally do. You may be sending scriptures yourself to this person, and they might get tired of it. But that's the thing. You can't really try to size people up on whether or not you're going to you're going to give yourself out to them and go above and beyond. Because I truly believe when you love somebody, you do go above and beyond, but you have to protect yourself. If you notice one thing that you hear in the ring with boxers, the referee would tell them, protect yourself at all times. The problem is, is we don't protect ourselves at all times. We say, I'm here for you, I love you, and I'm going to do this. But then you mess around and you leave your hands down and a person that has an addiction, I don't care what it is, they don't see you. They see the addiction. So you will get hurt in the process because they don't see you. They see I got to have it, I got to get it, and you're not protecting yourself. Prime example, if you know this person has an addiction and they don't have any money, why would you leave your pocketbook laying around saying, well, that's my family or that what? <laughs> it could have been my own mom. Huh. If I knew she had an addiction, right. no, 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 my, my wallet never stays on my dresser. That's right. It stays in my purse right. or it's locked up. That's right. yeah. you, once you know someone have a problem and you don't protect yourself, you're not to blame but you. Right. You're thinking that person can see past their addiction and see you. Well, this is my husband. This is my wife. This is my boyfriend. This is my girlfriend. This is my child. No, no, no. They don't see you. You ever just stop yourself for a second. Whatever it is, whether it's chocolate, males, females, drugs, whatever the addiction you've had in your past, because probably nobody here tonight have an addiction. But think about anything, chocolate, ice cream that calls your name out when you walk by. You can't walk by the kitchen without it just going. 
<laughs> and you know you shouldn't have it. Think about how it, it's a craving. And if, if you really don't deal with it, and you can even deal with it sometimes, and it still calls you out. The doctor had told you, say, hey, look here, if you don't stop this, it's going to kill you. And you still. Maybe you're diabetic and you say you shouldn't have this. <laughs> Maybe you're this or that. Whatever it is. And you just like, when I mean it just calls you. you that's what's happening with Peter. See, a lot of times we want to just put it on drugs. It ain't just drugs. There's some type of an addiction. Whether it's, oh, they gotta just tell me thank you. In the ministry. You can get addicted to people walking up on Sunday saying, Pastor, that was a wonderful message. <coughs> and then when no, no, don't nobody say anything? Oh, oh. <laughs> it's not been a good message. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get in your feelings. <laughs> I try to be very careful about that. You know what? And some people come up and they just talk to me. They don't say nothing. I'll be like, good. I don't need nobody telling me it was a good message. Because God, and I know it. I know it. I'm like, God, you are just awesome. And just, he amazes me. I don't need nobody to, to make put me there somewhere. I'm just like, you know, you, you all know. No, no, no. If one person hears the word of God, that's what matters most. And really are changed or delivered. That's the testimonies I want to hear. Folk walking up to me saying, Pastor, let me tell you what the word did to me today. I have been dealing with such such, but that word, not you, Pastor, the word yes. is what convicted me. The word is what changed me. And I feel like I can go a, a, a step further. It's the word. Yes. That's how our life has, has to be. Amen. You have to have your life so at the place that I'm telling you what. It don't matter about the stuff. The stuff. The stuff can't matter. And we're so caught up on the stuff until a lot of us are addicted to the stuff. You don't have to have a lot of money to be addicted to stuff. And don't get me wrong, Lord Jesus, because my grandparent, you know, they long and gone. But some of y'all will be able to identify this one here with me. I think it was some form of addiction. I could be wrong. Anybody have the grandparents that the coffee table or the, uh, whatever the table in the house had about a thousand wood knots on it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That had to be an addiction. Every time you go somewhere, you got to buy a little something and you set them things all over the place. My grandmother was like that. Yes. You like that? Okay. <laughs> And, and, and I'm telling you, if you see one, you automatically feel like a, and it don't matter how many you have, that's all, it's anything like that in life. Some of us, we like uh, Gucci pocketbooks, Louis Vuitton pocketbooks, Coach pocketbooks. Uh, what else you have, baby? <laughs> Judy Burke, yeah. Some of us, you know. <laughs> Take, for example, we're going to do inventory here. How many shoes do some of us have? I have more than enough. I'm telling you. And I watched these little boys the other day on Instagram, and this little boy's about this tall. I don't know how many of y'all see him. He's got to be the cutest little dude. It's somewhere like in Africa somewhere, and he's doing a little dance, doing something like this. No shoes at all, and I, it just amazed me. I'm like, yes. here we are, have a ton of stuff in the house. Yes. We got even basements full of stuff. <laughs> mm. I like it. <laughs> we bought a house to put stuff <coughs> in the basement or wow. in rooms. <laughs> Addictions, I'm telling you people, we need to deal with this thing and not just keep seeing it as a drug thing. It's not just a drug thing. It's things I could go through my life, I'm telling you. It's things that are sitting around that it's like, dude, do something with it. <laughs> you tell the truth. No, yes. I know you tell the truth. <laughs> That's 
truth. Addictions. It's so important tonight to take self-inventory. Stop looking at everybody else, and we need to look at ourselves. Yes. So we do that. We come to church, and I'm telling you, we do that. We got a lot of stuff going on, and that could be an addiction where you're constantly looking at everybody else, and you ain't looking at yourself. Yeah, like, you're looking at everybody else like, no, nah, y'all got to, y'all have to, you got to, you got to, instead of just saying, guess what, imagine if we had 75 people in here, and everybody's sitting here doing praise and service like this, but you just jump up and start running. You imagine the fire you're going to set off. Mm -hmm. See, this is, and some people say that's the old church, but that's not the old church. That is an excited church. Yes. That is a powerful church. Yes, that the, I'm telling you, it, it's not back when, it's now. Yes. That yes. folk are praising God and folk are just something. The Bible says it's like fire shut up in my mouth. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I'll challenge anybody tonight. Let me put some fire on you. I'm going to see what you do. Yes. But we'll come to church. Ooh, and act like that fire's there, but we just yeah. kind of, yeah, let's go get some physical fire. Yeah. <laughs> we got a light up in here. Yeah. <laughs> Who's willing to take this test? Yeah. I challenge you tonight. Yeah. You just stand there with that fire on you. Mm. Woo. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for us to be so, it's gratitude. Yeah. Thank you. And see, we get so caught up into mm. immediate gratification, yeah. but it's going down the wrong road a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. We want folk to give us that gratification on things we do, things we say. And God is like, no, 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 that's backwards because I promise yeah. you, if you live based off of them giving you gratitude, you're going to die based off of them rejecting you, based off them not giving you no type of praise, giving you nothing. Amen. So it's important to really know God. Know his word. Yeah. Know what he says about you. It doesn't matter what you say about me, old pastor. I don't like how you preach it all, okay? <laughs> no, is God okay with it? Yes. It shouldn't matter. But we get we get caught up. Here's that addiction. Yeah. I don't know how I got on addiction, but we're there. So we might as well deal with it. But yeah. addictions. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awesome if we had an addiction to praise where we like, man, if I don't get my praise and I don't feel right, wouldn't that be awesome? awesome. Mm -hmm. See, all addictions ain't bad. That's right, that's right. Wouldn't it be awesome that, you know what, when I get at home or in church, if I don't get my praise in, I don't feel right. I don't feel right. But instead, a lot of times, it's the other way around. Let Sister Pandora jump up there and run around church. This is what most people are going to do. Wrong with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're not going to join in with her and say, let's praise her. What's wrong with her? Yeah. Glory be to God. Yeah. <laughs> right I think I'm close on my time. I feel it. That's all right. Sure. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good work. Good work. Yes. Hallelujah. Good work. He is just awesome. Thank you. He gives to you and you deliver. That's right. So it's so important. Here we go again. You have that addiction. I'm going to bring it in right here. You have that addiction. It's just like going down the road. You're on the interstate. You're on 81. And you recognize I'm going the wrong way. Say it again. Take the exit. God give you exits for a reason. That's right. But we won't take the exit. We're going to keep on riding. Oh, no. Oh, that exit right there. I think I'm going to go a little bit further. I might be. You're going the wrong no, way. You <laughs> Get off the exit. Turn that car around. Turn your life around and go the right direction. If you're not close, because one time it's a certain stretch on um, 220. If you pass the exit down there, like to Greensboro, you got to go up. Oh, you really got to go that much further. Yeah. You, you done did it before it happened to you. Because I have. <laughs> and I'm telling you what, the whole time I'm driving, I'm like, man, I shouldn't have missed that exit. Because you got to go out your way now to get back and come back around. So sometime in your life, you just going to have to pull off the road. And you need to have a conversation with God. Like, God, look here. I can't go no further without you. 
Right. Yes. Then get back going. Put Thank your you. hands in his hands. Yes. Get that exit, find that exit, turn your life around. Yes. And it, it sounds simple and it really is simple, but the one thing Lady Monique said up here that she asked the question, are they willing? That's right. You see, folk, one thing you gotta be careful about is wanting more for people than they want for yes. themselves. That's yes. true. Yes. You can love somebody so much that you want and you see something in them. And we do this a lot with our grown children, too. Oh, glory be to God. Sometimes I'm telling you, they can get on your nerves. You can preach to them. You can tell them everything. You can say, hey, look here. It's a pitfall there. I wouldn't do that if I were you. And they still go do it. Yeah. And at some point, you got to realize, I want more for you than you want for yourself. And when that's the case, that's when people are telling you, it don't mean you let them go, but you got to draw back. You got to say, this year you're going to learn one of two ways. You can either learn by wisdom or hard knocks. Hard knocks, they hurt. And typically, this is the sad part of it. Yes, and most parents, y'all will be able to identify with me. The reason why we're constantly trying to tell them and tell them because we know that hard knock is more than likely going to cost us. <laughs> Yeah. And, and as a parent, we're not going to sit there and watch them. We're going to be like, damn, I tried to tell you, but now you, now you need $2,000, now you need $500, now you need when I try to tell you. <laughs> That's why we just go go and go. But I'm serious. you got to start looking at people, and when you want more than they want for themselves, you got to know how to pull back. Because I'm telling you right now, it'll end up hurting you more than it hurt them. They'll get into trouble, whatever this and that happened, and they sitting back like, well, you know, this is what's going on, but whatever. And you sit back, lose a sleep at night. Because that's your child. Because that's your loved one. Because you don't got feelings for that person. See, your feelings for people is what it gets you caught up. When you don't have feelings for somebody, you can kind of be like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll pray for you. But we got feelings for somebody. You pray for them, and you also sitting around. It's like it's now it has become your problem. Mm -hmm. That's right. You're just losing sleep. Glory, I'm telling you, I've lost some sleep over some of these children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you don't get that back. You don't find it. That's right. So it's truly important. Start telling folk in your life. When you see people doing some dumb stuff, say, look, all you got to do is get off the ramp. Get off the exit. Take the exit. Take the next one, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just start telling some folks. What do you mean? You need to get off that work. the road you headed on. You know it ain't right. You need to get off that to turn around. Because what you're doing, it's going to be detrimental. What you're doing, it may cause some, here we go again, collateral damage. Folk around you getting hurt. That's right. Typically we say like this, oh, I ain't hurt nobody. This is all about me. Oh, it ends up hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. Like Dickie yeah. T said, you know what, the family, everybody got to deal with this. Now the family all concerned and worried. Now the family, we trying to get some money together because they told you you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. If you don't come up with $5,000, now everybody calling around, hey, you think you can get boo boo uh, $20? You think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, house up, everything. It's <laughs> Glory be to God, I'm telling you. But we know, and this is where, like I say, we're going to bring it in there, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. Ain't nothing you're going through. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's nothing we will ever go through that somebody else ain't already been through. Stop sitting around thinking you're special. Because you're not. Why this is me? Nobody else will this. No, you're lying. You're having a pity party. You want somebody to come up. Here we go again. You're addicted to somebody coming up and just saying, oh, no, it's going to be okay. No, get yourself together. Stop holding people like, oh, yeah, I, I got to have this pity party because it's, it's on. They come to you and trust me, they already know the answer. They just need you to just <coughs> pat them up. They're addicted. They need you to do that stuff. Uh-uh. It's time out. And give them that scripture. First Corinthians 10 13 says that nothing you're going through is abnormal. Somebody else been through it. Oh, you just hard. 
<laughs> I don't need your hard love. No, I don't need your pity party. <laughs> but the Bible said, God is faithful and just. He said, now this is what he said here. And I am bringing it in. He said, I would take the temptation that is on your doorstep, and I'll use that for you to find how to wait to it before it stays. I will use the temptation. He didn't say I'm just going to. He said, I will use the temptation to give you a way of escape. That's right. I like that amen. <laughs> Y'all think that baby was saying something else. That baby was saying amen. Right? <laughs> Hopefully y'all were blessed by the word tonight. Yes. Yes. Blessed by the word tonight. Y'all better. Also, take the exit ramp.